God Loki, the teacher of magic. When that entire system, the Scandinavian system, was planned by the gods according to the level and agreements which they had initially, it were the first five gods specifically. The four that we already covered and Loki, whom we are covering today, they formed a foundation or a core team in which Odin took care of the informational content of the whole system the Yggdrasil tree, or to be more precise, it became the Yggdrasil somewhat later. At first it was this system of the Proto-Foundations, and Odin took care of the correct filling of the Proto-Foundation system, thereby making it the Yggdrasil tree, system in the process. Tyr, the supervisor of the entire project, knew the law. He knew the main principles as to how all of it should be developing. Thor provided the overall protection of the system. Heimdall predetermined the system structure. Loki, respectively, also fulfilled a necessary and important mission, which is the development. Loki is a trickster god, the god of chaos. Chaos in certain quantities, in certain doses, is needed for the development of the system. When Tyr lost his rights to rule over the law, as well as over the law of the entire system, and Odin naturally came as a replacement, this entire system was broken. And it was shortly after this period that Loki was forcefully removed. Understandably, it wouldn't be correct to describe it using human chronology or timelines, but if we look at it step by step, according to the sequence of events, we will see that the deposition of Tyr brought about the respective deposition of Loki, which led to Ragnarok. Because Loki is the one who controls the chaos that enters the system. If Loki doesn't control the chaos, then who knows, maybe chaos won't come at all, or it will come in quantity that wouldn't be manageable for the system. It is the latter that happened to the world of the Norse gods, to the gods of the Scandinavian pantheon. Ragnarok is the last battle with the increasingly growing channels of chaos. The channels which Loki provided on one hand, but also controlled on the other. So, it is the most peculiar figure, the trickster god, the mocker, who can do absolutely everything. There is no task that Loki can't do. There is no place that he won't be able to get to. There is no form that he won't be able to assume. At the same time, he never does it for himself but exclusively for the sake of the system, or the cause. Actually, all these gods, the first five, never do anything for themselves, but always for the cause. But Loki, possessing colossal resources and abilities by blood, as well as in his own right, has the ability to be anything. every time fulfilling a certain specific mission and obtaining effects a concept an essence of which up until a certain point remains known only to him alone and nobody else so our objective will be to make sense of his actions and doings as well as of the primary principle that he brings with his existence his task is to affect the gods, to influence the system. He never influences people directly, meaning that people, in principle, do not concern him, similarly as they don't concern the rest of these five gods. But the first four gods manifest themselves through people. Loki, however, will affect you according to the way he would be affecting the particular god that manifests himself through you. Meaning that if you are a carrier of the potential of a certain god, then Loki will likely see that god in you, rather than see you personally. Am I making myself clear? Therefore, looking at the relationships between Loki and the gods, we can predetermine, estimate, 
What sort of attitude will be manifested towards you personally? If it is Odin that you feel yourself closer to, then Loki will position himself as in his relationship to Odin, who is his brethren. If it is Thor, then it will be apprehension and certain, say, digs here and there. If it is Tyr, then it will be a compassion simultaneously with, if not with contempt, then with pity as to he, Tyr, didn't make it. And if it is Heimdall, then there will be obvious animosity. Why there is obvious animosity between Loki and Heimdall, we will try to reason through today in our current class. They started together, meaning this entire project concerning the Scandinavian pantheon, they built this system together. And even the legends tell us that they created the first human beings together as well. Odin gave them spirit, Hanir, the second god, gave them sense, and Ladur gave them blood and goodly color. This is what the myths tell us. Blood and goodly color is life in its essence. It is the emotions. It is what separates a man from a reasonable man as well from a spiritual man. It is a certain additional component not at an animalistic component in particular, but something that defines a man as a man. What is a man? A man is not only a thinking man, not only a spiritual man. Before anything else, a man is a being that feels, a being that is capable of emotions, a being capable of empathy, perhaps, or at least a feeling. So the feelings, worries, certain anger, the emotions, and being able to shape one's own life path using these emotions is the gift of Loki. His origins are not completely clear. On the one hand, he is a descendant of the Jotun giants and therefore possesses the nature of a shapeshifter that is inherent to all Jotuns. On the other hand, as it is described, he is a relative of Surt, and therefore is a fiery nature. Even his name Loki or Logi means fire, and in many instances he embodies a certain primordial fire, the world of Muspelheimer, the world of transformation and the initial beginnings. His rune is Dagaz, and Dagaz is the key to the world of Muspel. And the legends tell us that only those who are of Muspel blood can enter Muspelheimer. Also, the same legends tell us that Surt the Giant and his fiery current would be the last to join the Battle of Ragnarok, defining the victor. Surt is impossible to beat. There are only two weapons that are able to beat Surt. The first one was owned by Freyr, but he lost it. Let's just say that he lost it. And we will talk about it eventually. The second weapon was crafted by Loki himself. And according to the story, it was the one weapon that could cause significant harm to Surt the Giant. But this weapon was hidden in Muspelheimer itself, in a casket protected by Surt's own wife, and no one, aside from someone of the Muspel blood, can enter the world of Muspelheimer. And therefore no one but Loki is able to get it. This is the way he encrypted this particular weapon, meaning that if there is someone who can handle, beat Surt, this initial mad fire current, informational current, it is nobody except for Loki. And no one else can get to this weapon. However, these are the events of the future. But first, he, as a member of the team, participated in the creation of the Nine Worlds. And when they were building this program, the interaction program of all systems, all worlds, such as the interaction with the world of humans, the world of giants, the world of gods with Aesir and Vanir, Loki was the most active participant in this process. His presence in every legend, every myth, is as evident as the presence of Odin. If not directly, then indirectly. There is even a saying, 
If you don't know whose fault it is, it will be Loki's fault, because there is no one else that the blame can be assigned to. And truly, all the legends tell us that he was bothering the gods at the same time as he was helping them, and the algorithm of his interference or help are completely unclear, as if he is acting intuitively on a whim, so to say. In actuality, if we look closer at his actions, we will be able to recognize a clear system how and when he helps. Basically, in situations that are related to the development or the weakening of the system. That is where we see Loki participate most actively, as well as occasionally serving the instigator of such events. Loki is someone who supplied the gods with all those artifacts that they were so proud of and that made them so mighty great. When they themselves weren't able or did not want to, due to their own certain snobby attitude to communicate with the worlds that are lower than theirs, particularly with the Alfheimer and Svartalheimer, they weren't able to obtain what could have been obtained from these worlds. But Loki did it splendidly. He did not like the Alves very much. Alves are Aesir's servants, and he doesn't like servants. We should mention and remember from the beginning that Loki dislikes minions. And actually, the Lokasena, the actual plot to the story, begins when Loki slays Aegir's servant, who was excessively praised by others, those who wanted to show favor to the nature god Aegir. Loki got angry mainly because of that. How? How could the gods praise the servant? How could they grovel before servants? Alves were the typical servants, and they did it out of their goodwill. Being close to the Vanir, as well as to the nature, and being dependent on the gods, allowed them to serve the gods of law. The Svartalfar, on the other hand, were no servants. They were more likely to be drawn to the Jotnar, to the giants, the carriers of the long memory, rather than the carriers of the law. They weren't really friendly with the gods, and as a consequence had many conflicts with them. The freedom-loving craftsmen, the dwellers of Svartalheimer, or more precisely all members of the Ivaldi family, who are so often mentioned in the sagas, they tried to be helpful to the gods, in order not to get on their bad side, so to say, knowing that they are vassals of the gods, knowing that they are dependent on them, however, also trying not to interact with them unless it was necessary. And the gods, too, considered the Svartalfar to be below themselves, since they grew from the maggots of Emir's flesh, so they chose not to interact with them. But Loki is a simple guy, a very much simple guy as we know it. He can easily dress up in women's clothing, meaning that he did not experience any loss of honor doing it, similar to going down to the Svartalfar to make the necessary arrangements. His first voyage to visit the Svartalfar happened right after the story involving Sif. After Thor got angry about the offense and harm imposed upon his wife, so Loki decided to appease Thor. He said, all right, I will immediately go visit our friends and they will smith some awesome hair for your wife. You won't be able to tell them from real hair. We will put it on her head and they will attach right away. But the god's outer unsightliness, so to say, was not as terribly important as something else, which is staying loyal and true to one's own ideals. And it is Loki in contrast to other gods, as the story, his story shows us, who turned out to be more resilient to provocations, preserving his honor, his rules of engagement, his function, for the sake of which he started this whole campaign with the other gods, longer than anyone else.